he was like, people are fascinated with youth because deep down they, they desire a relationship with me, but they're trying to tell themselves they have more time, hmm. that they're going to get it together when they get older. And I saw so many people that just, they were sad. And I was sad long enough. All right, well, welcome to the show. I have had the most amazing day I've had in a long time. We were at uh, my school, School of the Holy Family, and we had Justin Fatika there. Now I came running over here. We went to the Capitol to support a bill for Catholic education. Now we're here. I get to meet the... I, you guys, this is really amazing. So about three months ago, <clears throat> I always listen to XM Radio in my truck, and okay. I always listen to the Comedy Channel. Cool. Le Jeff and Larry's Comedy Round. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm sitting there listening. And all of a sudden, this guy, Steve Simone, comes on. And I'm like, I'm listening. Like, your, your humor in regards to your family and, like, food. And it's, it's, it's good. It's clean. It's, and, you know, like, you're, you're in the secular world, right? Yeah. So you're not it's, – it's, it's not overtly faith-based. Yeah. I remember one show where you're like, I just want to talk about, like, loving people and, and doing good to feel good. And, yes. like, you just try it, you know? And so, like, there's this kind of – sub subverted Christian message uh, underneath yeah. it all. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. <clears throat> I want to welcome Steve. He's a, a, com a comedian from Comedy Central. Uh, grateful that you're here. He's here with uh, Heart as Nails Ministry. Uh, we're at St. Mary's Central High School right now filming. And there's a big event tonight called the Breakthrough Event. Uh, Justin's going to be here. Steve's going to open with some comedy, some laughter, some praise and worship. So hopefully breakthroughs, people's Amen. lives changing. So, uh, But I want to get started just... Uh, <clears throat> He's a funny guy, <laughs> funny guy, you know? And like, you think when you hear a funny guy, you're like, this guy's got it all together. He's just enjoying life. And I think you are now. Yeah. But there were, you know, from my understanding, there were some hardships and, uh, and, and how you kind of got through that and how the faith kind of formed you in that. That's, yeah, I mean, I think that's life, right? Right. <laughs> like, I don't think my story is unique to anybody's. I think that... Like I'm, like, I'm originally from Philadelphia, and I'm like a huge Rocky Balboa guy. And there was a scene in a movie, I think it was the Rocky Balboa one, that I call it Rocky Six, but I don't think that's They're all the name. same show, yeah. pretty much anyway. But he was like talking about life with his son, and he was like, life will put you on your knees, but you just can't stay there. And I think that's, I went through it for sure. Like I remember reading uh, St. John of the Cross, Dark Knight of the Soul, and I was like, he gets it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like um, I don't know. I, I know how I got out of it, and that was just really meeting Jesus, getting to know him. How did that and, happen? Um, I think now I can look back at it and see that it was just I needed humility. I, I was trying so hard to be perfect, and I, I know um, – a lot of, I think that's a common problem for for some cradle Catholics. Like I was blessed to grow up in a, a Catholic home and there was a lot of joy there, you know, but also it's life, a lot of challenges, a lot of problems, but somehow, somewhere along the way, as a very young man, I thought that I almost needed to earn God's love. Like I, I had so much love and, and fear of God that I just wanted to be perfect. Like, I kind of felt like Jesus was my bookie and I owed him a lot of money. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Here's I'm that. like, how am I going to pay this back? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I get heaven forever. And I'm like, what am I going to do to get that? And then I think slowly, like, God was just like, are you ready for me? Are you ready for me to take it? Do you still want to do it on your own? Or are you ready for me to carry it? Um, I mean, honestly, nobody happy moves to Los Angeles. <laughs> You're not you're like people. The, I love when you say it's the saddest place on earth. Oh, it is. It's like you know what I realize because people move there with the unconscious thought of "I'll show you, I'll show you all. One day you'll be happy that I'm your friend, and I'm going to be rich and famous and have a Ferrari. Then you'll like me." And that was really what I thought. I don't know how that happened. I don't know why. I'm just going to chalk it up to life. But I went there thinking that I honestly I needed to become rich and famous to be happy and 
I didn't become rich. I didn't become famous, but I did get something better. I got this personal relationship with Jesus. And we're all pilgrims, right? We're all on this journey, and you take one step forward, two steps back. But the joy I feel now is real. Like I tell my buddies, they're like, why are you so happy? And I'm like, because I've got my snorkel in heaven. <laughs> like, what? I go, no matter breathing how grace. stinky it is, I'm, like, I'm breathing in heaven's grace. You know what I mean? And, and it's not a denial of how difficult life can be. But I, I know how difficult it can be. It's impossible. Life is impossible without Jesus. And I'm just grateful through his mercy and grace that he brought me to an appreciation of the Catholic Church I did not have as a younger man. Like, uh, I mean, now my, my, my life is daily rosary, mass as often as possible, adoration as often as possible. Um, even the, the priest at my church, he's like, are you in confession again? I'm like, yes, again, I'm back. <laughs> because I'm almost like, I view it almost like a gym. Like I wanna, I wanna stay in spiritual, like if, if I start to go out there on my own, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get lost again. I know it. Well, I think that's one of the beauties of confession too, right? Constantly brings you back. Yes. It constantly brings you back that I can't do this on my own. I need help. And I think that that's like where a lot of people are missing it. And something you said was actually, so there was this survey done like 50 years ago, right? And they asked all these little kids, they were like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're like, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be yeah. a doctor. I want to be an astronaut. There was, there was no common denominator. Uh, they did it like five years ago. Mm -hmm. And overwhelmingly, like mm -hmm. overwhelmingly, it's in like the 90%, yeah. they said, I want to be famous. Wow. And you just think about that, like when you're, you know, like just what you said, I want to be famous and like, yeah, like I got something to prove to the world and then the world just knocks you on your butt. Yeah. <clears throat> and most people have nowhere to turn and so they're going to turn to something to fill it. Of course. <clears throat> right, something's going to fill it and oftentimes that's really destructive. But, I, you know, I think the, the, the power of your testimony is, it's in the, you know, the gradual yeah you know, little by little by little. And, and even growing up as a cradle Catholic, I did too. I mean, I had, I had a great mom and dad and fell away for a while and, yeah. and, and, uh, but it was that, that basis in the faith that was kind of my anchor and held me there. Amen. So how do you, like, my question then is, <clears throat> so you say, you know, you're, you're in LA where it's the saddest place on earth. It's pretty sad. How do you like, how do you live in that and still stay Catholic and still like you're around a lot of people that are not of the faith. I'm assuming. Yeah. But they're awesome. Like it made like, I felt like I would have conversations with God where I really felt like I was dropped behind enemy lines. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm are. like, Oh my gosh, what's going on here? But there were so many beautiful things to that experience because I saw people that had everything I thought I wanted hmm. and they still weren't happy. Like one of my day jobs, uh, I worked at Gold's Gym in Venice and that's where I met Justin. <laughs> but I remember this story vividly. There was a woman that uh, worked out at the gym and one day she was like, Steve, can I ask you a question? I was like, go for it, toots. What is it, right? <laughs> she, she was like, why are you so happy? I'm like, what do you mean? She was like, you're always smiling. You always have something nice to say to everybody. And she was like, don't take this the wrong way, but you shouldn't be this happy. <laughs> she was like, you make like no money. Right. And she said, she was like, I'm going to be honest with you. She was like, and she showed, she was like, do you see what I'm wearing? She was like, I color coordinate this workout outfit. I color coordinate my workout outfits to the color of my Bentleys. She was like, I have seven Jeez. Bentleys. She was like, and the Range Rover I drive when I take the dogs. She was like, how come you're happier than I am? And I was like, do you really want to know the truth? <laughs> she could tell, she knew it. She went, I went, do you really want to know the truth? And she went, is it God? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, I thought so. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, that could be the only explanation for it, you know? And that was something the Holy Spirit really put on my heart last time I was in LA. I was there right before Christmas. And I have nothing but love for Los Angeles. I don't want it to seem like I'm, I mean, it, there's so many beautiful things there. And it's a special place, and it breaks my heart to see where it is now. But one of the things I would sort of, sort of, I guess, criticize might be the word. I don't know if it's too strong, but I would make fun of guys my age in L.A. that would dress and act like they were 25. 
You know what I mean? I thought it was hilarious because nobody in L.A. gets married. Nobody has kids. Nobody's coaching Little League. Everybody's got skinny jeans, retro Jordans, and they're like, hey, follow me on Talk Talk. That's the word, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, And I'm like, bro, you need a hug. You should have had a kid. Like, this is embarrassing. And that was a joke I used to do. But then the Holy Spirit put it in my heart. He was like, Steve, that's really not the charitable way to look at it. He was like, the reason why... And I don't know, this was just, I don't know if it's a real download. I'm glad I get to run this by a priest. <laughs> so he was like, people are fascinated with youth because deep down they, they desire a relationship with me, but they're trying to tell themselves they have more time, hmm. that they're going to get it together when they get older. And I saw so many people that just, they were sad. And I was sad long enough. And I remember... One of the worst hangovers I've ever had after a St. Patty's Day bender. And it, like when I was like 22, I thought I had a hangover. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that was a headache. A real hangover <laughs> will get you worse. to reevaluate your life. <laughs> like I woke up like March 18th, still didn't get out of bed until like the 20th. And I was like, <laughs> I'm going to start going back to church. And I was so grateful for that decision. And slowly, I was like, well, I, 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 sh I got to get the confession. Then I'm like, I've been carrying around these rosaries. I, I say it every once in a while. I should probably say it every day. And then in the since I moved to Florida, there's a lot of opportunities for Eucharistic adoration. And that's just been that's my favorite thing. You know, it's, it's interesting <clears throat> you say that. You know, it was that it was that point of desolation, uh -huh. right? <clears throat> the point of where you were at your worst, yes. maybe, is when God is at his, at his best. Yeah. You know, that's, that's when he's getting it. I, the, the story, the scripture story that always hits me is, you know, when it says Peter, you know, he's get, he just got done fishing. Yeah. And he's packing everything up, and all of a sudden, it just says Jesus gets into his boat. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. Like, you're, you get home from work, and you're doing, and all of a sudden, some random guy gets in you're your like, Oh, great. This is all I need. <laughs> yeah, some, One more thing, God. You want to know why nobody believes? And now i got a cuckoo climbing <laughs> in my boat. And this is, and it's, what's cool about it is the boat symbolizes Peter's life. Yeah. Because that's what he does. Mm -hmm. And Jesus gets into that boat, not at the best time. You know, if you read just prior to that, it says that he fished all night and caught nothing. Yeah. So he is feeling like a failure, a loser. He's supposed to be a great fisherman. He's not. And it's at that moment that God gets into their life. And I think, you know, and this is one of the things with Hard as Nails, right? Nobody suffers alone is kind of their big yeah. mission. And <clears throat> I think that suffering, if we can just, like, everybody's trying to run from it. Yeah. And if they can just enter into it. Yep. And see that, yeah, I'm, I'm not that great. I, I yes. am broken, yes. and I need help. Yes. That's, that's where God is, like, exploding. It's the best. It is. It's like a lot of my friends, I've been, I think one of the coolest things I get to do is just be there for people, you know? And it's gotten to the point where sometimes, like, where somebody's like, really opening up their heart and being vulnerable with me and talking about their brokenness. And I'm being as compassionate as I can, but part of me is like, yes, <laughs> it's about to happen. Oh, you have no idea how good it's going to get. <laughs> Just say yes. Just say, and I, like even people that don't believe, like I break everything that my relationship with God is simple as possible. And I'm like, hey man, just let the love love you. Hmm. Start with that step. Just let the love love you and take it from there. Love it. Love loves for love's sake. Amen. <clears throat> that came to me one time in prayer, and I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So so you mentioned you were at you were working at Gold's Gym. Yep. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger, Gold's Gym, right? Yeah. Like, I think he wasn't working out when I was there. I joined it <laughs> yeah, because I, wanted, I was like, maybe I'll get a chance to meet Hulk Hogan. And I did. And I kept really? on calling him brother, and he was like, you break it. Like, he, for a second, he was like... <laughs> <laughs> bro, bro, brother, I, I couldn't. I couldn't. I was like, "Don't say brother. Don't say brother." And I was like, "Have a good day, brother." And then he turned around. He's like, "How many times are you gonna say brother, brother?" I'm like, "I'm sorry, brother." <laughs> but it was the best. Like I went there because I like my. I was living with my brother. <laughs> You're showing off now, God. But um, my younger brother and I were roommates, and I was doing comedy, and I was like, kind of like barely scraping by. And he was like, "I don't care if you can pay your rent." He was like, I don't want you around the household that you have to get a job. And uh, I was like, what am I going to do? What's flexible enough? What? And 
I got a job at Gold's Gym primarily to meet Hulk Hogan and uh, 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 other cool people. Lou Ferrigno worked out no there, way. the real incredible Hulk. The, yeah, one, once original. he gave me the business, he was like, that was an awfully like dumbbell to be doing that to you. And I was like, <laughs> and he was like, I'm just kidding, buddy. Good workout. I'm like, Lou Ferrigno told me I had a good workout. <laughs> Ric Flair was there. Woo! Nice. He, yeah, he let me wear his gold Rolex when he worked out. <laughs> and I met Justin. That's, yeah, right. <laughs> it was Frigno, uh, Hulk Hogan, and Justin Fatica. Nice. Yeah, and it was really cool. Was that like, I mean, like, was that a one-day thing and you guys connected? Or was that? Yeah. You, okay. He was in town. He was looking to work out. And he was, like, trying to figure out how to, like, how the prices were for the gym and stuff. And I'm like... Got to keep my eye on this guy that he doesn't try to sneak in. Like, I took my job seriously. And then we started to talk, and I don't know, we got on, we started to talk about God, and then he had mentioned, like, the litany of humility, and I'm like, I just read it, and I pulled out my Pieta prayer book, and he was like, who are you? I'm like, who are you, bro? <laughs> and then we we hung out a couple, a few more times while he was in town, grabbed lunch, connected, exchanged phone numbers, stayed in touch for a little bit. Then we drifted away, and then during the pandemic, hmm. we came back uh, in an awesome way where now he's letting me to be a part, a tiny little part of his amazing ministry. That's awesome. So, like, <clears throat> what, it, what, what was kind of the stepping stone for you to go from, you know, just kind of like a, I don't know, it's like a, a mediocre comedian to, you know, like, where did you, what, what, what oh, was it? all it? process. I, I learned so much about life and my relationship with God and how to be a person through comedy. Like, um, I think God gives you a vocation so you can understand him. Amen. Like, my dad was a math teacher and he would always say, God's the great mathematician in the sky. And I'm like, nerd. <laughs> 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 but, uh, like, for me... Being a comedian was very much about being in the moment. Uh, like I could prepare what I was going to do, but I really had no control over how it was going to work. And that just be alive in the moment. I'm like, oh, wait, God is in the moment. Um, I kept on just saying yes, just kept on show, just showing up. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved being a comedian. And it didn't matter that I was stinky. And one of the best things that ever happened to me was I got booed off stage by like a thousand people. I really hope that doesn't happen tonight. <laughs> but I got booed off stage by maybe 800, close to a thousand people, drunk gang members in San Diego that got in for free. There was this venue, it was called 4th and B, and they would just let people in for free and then sell them $10 beers. And by the time I got on stage, they were well into those $10 beers. <laughs> And it just, it just didn't work for whatever reason. It just didn't work. And like I was two minutes into my show and I'm like, uh Oh, I'm not connecting with this audience. I don't know. And then I was like, oh, and I started to get nervous and then they were like, uh, oh, and then they could sense that I was getting nervous. Then I'm like, let me get to my closing bit. Cause I know that'll work. Nothing. Then I heard like the first boo, then another boo. And this is like the worst case scenario. This is the reason why people don't do comedy. They're like, what happens when they boo? What happens when they heckle? I really thought somebody was going to stand up and say, get him. And the, a thousand people would just, like, you know, that's what I thought was going to happen. Like they throw tomatoes, like out of the three stooges or cartoons. And I literally was under so much stress. I had an out of body experience. I saw myself on stage bombing and I'm like, this is awful. And then my soul, like my perspective, I got, and I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. And the stage manager was on the side of the stage. He's going, get off, get off. I was like nine minutes in. I was supposed to do a half an hour. He's like, we'll still pay you. Just leave. You're ruining the show. You're ruining it. And I was so calm at that point. I went from complete fear to realizing it wasn't that bad. And then I giggled to myself. I'm like, the best thing about being a comedian is when it doesn't work, people just don't laugh. <laughs> There's <laughs> zero stakes. <laughs> There's nothing. I'm like, if you're a teacher and you have a bad day, some kid's never going to learn how to read. You're a doctor, <laughs> you have a bad day, you're going to have to make a difficult phone call to somebody's <laughs> family. As a priest, you have a bad day, somebody might lose their relationship with God. That's as high as the stakes get. I have a bad day at the office. They're like, that guy wasn't funny. <laughs> Make the check out to Steve. I still get paid. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So that, that was a crucial step for me going, why am I doing the type of comedy I think they want? 
if bombing isn't that bad, at least start to say what you want to say. Right. And I started to do that. And then um, I did start to realize I, I changed my perspective, right? Like you can look at the same picture, but it's how you look at it. And I read an interview with um, Jim Carrey, who was a hero of mine. And was one of the reasons why I really was excited to be a part of the comedy store in Hollywood because he was one of the many famous comedians that got their start there. And he was talking about a comedic mindset in this interview. And in particular, he was talking about there was a legendary comedian named Rodney Dangerfield oh, yeah. who died a very miserable man, sadly. And he was friends with Jim. And Jim had said the problem with thinking comedically is you're always thinking about what's wrong. And that's what makes it funny. And he said, over a lifetime of training your brain to think about what's wrong, it's going to make you miserable. Hmm. And I was like, I'm miserable now. I don't want it to get any worse. <laughs> right. So it was that. And then there was a poem by this poet, Charles Bukowski, who was like this, um, like all the cool kids in LA thought he was the coolest person ever. So I started to read his poems. And the one that stuck out to me was about... Um, what sends somebody to the madhouse, what makes somebody really go crazy isn't the big things in life, like bankruptcy or divorce or illness. He said it's when you bend over to tie your shoe and the shoestring snaps. He goes, that's it. And I went, okay. If those little things are what can set you over the edge in a negative way, they can also be the little glimpses of joy that keep you going. And I said... I don't want to do comedy that talks about what's wrong. Everybody's doing that. Let me talk about what's right, what's really good. And I started to rewire my brain a little bit with God's grace and came back to the sacraments hard. And then one, I did a comedy album, it went to number one, it did great, but there were a couple bad words on it. So my mom couldn't play it for her friends and I felt like a <laughs> failure. I'm like, oh man. You never like, want to let your I mom worked so hard, like. <laughs> Well, we enjoyed it, but we're not going to play it for the neighbors. I'm like, Mom, it's like two F-bombs on there. It's not that bad. You should see the filth I'm performing with. So that year, I uh, I gave up cursing on stage for Lent. And I was like, oh, I don't need to do this. So then the next album, I did, um, I did it completely clean, and I kind of dedicated it to my mom and moms in general. And it changed my career because they started to play it on the radio. And I'm like, guess who doesn't need a day job anymore? <laughs> it was great. Yeah, so you, you know, one of the things you said was, you know, like when you were living with your brother, which brother was that? My younger brother. Is that Mark? Mark, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, how, like, they had a huge part, at least from what I've heard, you know, yeah. I, I'm just like I said, XM Radio, like, a huge part of your set is your brothers. Yeah. And your dad, mm -hmm. and your mom, and like, yeah, so, and, and, and what you got me thinking about that is when you're saying, looking at what's right. Because mm -hmm. when you look at your family life and you can you can joke about that because things were right, mm -hmm. and but it fu I mean life is funny, of course you know life is funny. But like, what's your f <laughs> what's look? Your I, here's the thing though: when I talk about my family, everybody's like, "Oh, you had a perfect child." I'm like, "No." Like, there's a joke. I don't think they play this on the radio, but I'm like, family has to come back because in a family, it teaches you how to love unconditionally. Right. It teaches you forgiveness because if Think back to when you were a kid and how you really treated – how me and my brothers treated each other. I'll speak for myself. If I were to treat an adult, a stranger right now, if we went to a bar and I treated a stranger as poorly as I treated my little brother, I would go to jail. Right. Like in my house, a felony, a legitimate felony. Me and my brothers committed felonies against each other, <laughs> assault, blackmail, <laughs> extortion, attempted murder. Like legitimately, like right. that happened, but you forgive each other. And I think that's that that was my younger brother and I were Irish twins. We're only 51 weeks apart. We shared a bedroom growing up. He's my best friend. He's my hero. And there were times like I was not good to him, but he forgave me. And that was the best thing about growing up with brothers. Like you could be literally trying to strangle them. And two minutes later, you're like, you want the last bowl of cereal? You know what I mean? It's yeah, the my, best. My brother, one time, he said, he, we were sitting around. He has a lot of thoughts. <laughs> some of the, we're, Me and my brother are really, really close, too, and some of them are crazy. But the one he was saying, you know, he's like, I've been thinking a lot about this. He's like, the most sacred word on this earth 
is God, right? Mm -hmm. The most sacred word. He said, I think the second most sacred word on this earth is family. Amen. And I, you know, I like, I'm the same, you know, me and my brother had crazy battles and all this stuff. And and now we're like best friends. And it's, and I don't know, like, I think so many people take family for granted. Like I live with you, so you have to love me, you know, so you have to put up with all this stuff. And I think forgiveness often is a rare thing in families and that's what Mm -hmm. causes the division. Yeah. But what I'm wondering is like, what's your, what's your favorite story with your brothers? <clears throat> oh, they're all there's because you got a lot. Of them. Yeah, <laughs> like I mean, there's stuff I don't know what I sh- should share. We literally did try to kill each other sometimes. Um, like there was one I put on Comedy Central where my younger brother really was taking the video game controller cord and trying to strangle my older brother, but. I'm really trying to think of like a favorite, like people ask me, what's your happiest memory? What's this? What's the best thing you've ever done? And I really just think back to like simple family dinners, like having a place where I know I belonged and laughing with my family. Like that's what really broke my heart about being in LA, like being out there by myself. My brother lived, I lived out there for seven years. Then my brothers moved out for about four and then I was alone again. And Los Angeles can be a very lonely place. And I was like, man, that's what I miss. I just miss the little things that you take for granted. Just like, oh, mom made baked chicken and rigatoni, and we're all going to laugh. That was it, you know? The simplest thing. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And I will say this, because I don't want, I I have this thing where I'm so nervous that people are going to think I'm perfect and I have it figured out. And I don't. But I will say that, like, Prayer works, and you have to trust God's timing. And like I, like we talked about my depression. Like, there's levels to depression, but I don't think there's anything worse than a Burger King Christmas. <laughs> like being at a Burger King by yourself on the Sunset Strip, it's it's miserable. And I remember like actually being angry with God sometimes. Like I came out here. Because I thought you wanted me to use this talent to glorify you. And here I am. I don't have a dime. I don't have a car. I'm living with a 300-pound ex-Elvis impersonator. <laughs> I don't have money. I don't have money to go see my family at Christmas. And I'm eating a cheeseburger by myself. And then now I look at my life where I've been blessed. Where I was able to buy a little house. I was able to move my parents in. And to, to be able to just spend a Christmas with my brothers and their kids... And my parents has just been amazing. But there were years, years where that didn't happen. Yeah. Well, good. It was just uh, been a complete honor to be with you. Dude, this I'm, went by so fast, I, right? I know, right? And you're, I'm grateful you're out in North Dakota. Uh, you know, That's how much I love Jesus, guys. It was 80 <laughs> and sunny yesterday. And, and Fatika's what... like, bro, I got us a gig. I'm like... Whatever you want, Justin, I say yes. Because, like, to me, I'm like, that's the Holy Spirit that's got. Just say yes. Like, that's one of the definitions of a saint that I heard. I'm like, I'm down with that. It's somebody that says yes to Jesus and never stops saying yes. I'm like, and then he was like, how about North Dakota in February? And I'm like, eh. <laughs> he just, just missed, like, the coldest part of the year. So it's warming up at 10 degrees. So, but, uh, yeah. Uh, any final words, final thoughts? For I just want to are- say thank you. Oh, pray. 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 Pray the world needs it. And if uh, you're a Catholic and you're watching this and you haven't been in confession in a while because you're scared, don't be. Because you will feel so good when you leave. It's it's like hitting the Powerball of joy. <laughs> it's like really – like I really – there should be a reality show where it's people walking into a confessional like this like <laughs> – I don't know how, I don't even know how to say this one. And then they walk out and they're like, Panama, guess it's going to heaven. <laughs> Love it. Well, Steve, thank you. Thank you, Father. Great, great uh, honor to have you here. It We're looking my forward. honor. Great, look, uh, looking forward to tonight. It's going to be a great event. And uh, yeah, we'll be back next. Who knows gonna, who's going to be on, whatever God provides. Always a pleasure to be with all of you. Take care and God bless.